stuff with her? Or? Yeah, yeah, I got a, I got an email from her a couple of months ago. Yeah. Um, we talked about Ify and how he's going. Things seems things are going really well. With I her. think he's going there too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Most of them, I think. Yeah. Because okay. we're broadcasting. Oh, the mic's over here. But no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. The, like, yeah. The, they're just some some of the guys are a little bit more comfortable if, if they keep some of that first gym. I sort don't of believe thing. them one. Yeah, you go and visit them. Like, I've all moved. Like, I mean, I, I love hearing how the Baptist guy, talking about Baptist guys, yeah, going. Yeah, I was in last week. Uh, yeah. Last week. Uh, yeah. They'll have baptism in uh, last Sabbath of this month. Are they really? Awesome. Awesome. All right, well, um, I guess we better get started. I'm pretty much ready to go, so I might blow the show for us. everybody gets settled, I'll, um, for those of you that are able to join us um, for the broadcast, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We hope you stay with us over the next uh, half hour or hour. Um, today we're looking at uh, Acts um, chapter 10, and we're looking at anything and everything that goes down in chapter 10. Uh, I hope that there'll be something in it today that w- will uh, challenge you, will amaze you, will be something that's new to you. If it isn't, I just uh, I hope and I pray that um, that uh, you'll be confirmed with what you already know with what we um, what we're about to look at today. Um, we're Agadat Bris, that means Covenant Fellowship, and we are a sister congregation to Agadat Bris Temple, Texas, which is presided over by Rabbi Rob Miller. Uh, he founded this fellowship here in Australia. Um, some years ago now, and um, I'm happy to say uh, we're still here, and um, with all our, our warts and all, we're still here, and um, we believe in Yeshua, uh, otherwise known as Jesus, we um, follow his teachings, uh, as if he taught something that was different from the Torah, which we know he did it, and um, yeah, so that's pretty much who we are. We are, we are Nazarenes, um, and that means we are offshoot branch watchmen who follow uh, the offshoot branch of Jesse that's come out of the stump or the root of Jesse. That's who we are. Let, it, let that be proclaimed. Okay. Have For you, those of us sorry, that have you here, shared, shared this on Agudat Facebook? Right, okay. Am I in frame now? Okay. Well, okay then. Let's get started. So yeah, we're up to we're, we're shooting through the Book of Acts. We um, we know that the the Book of Acts originally um, didn't have a, a, a definite title. Uh, the more appropriate name for the Book of Acts would be Mighty Deeds of the Set Apart Sent Ones or the Holy Apostles. And in Hebrew, that is Ma'aseh Hashlukim, which means the the mighty deeds of those who were sent. To share the basar, which is 
the whole message or the full message. Uh, the word, which in Hebrew is the devar. Uh, so they, they shared the full devar of Yahweh. You want to be able to come through this door every Sabbath and every high, high Sabbath and you want to be ministered to by the devar of Yahweh. You don't want a dog and pony show. You don't want, you know, some some type of um, sort of thrill rush and people to be kind to you for, for, for kindness sake. You want the devar of Yahweh and all these other things are in addition and are added to you. So that's, that's our desire. We want the word of Yahweh. People don't want to listen to a motivational speaker or somebody who can wax very lyrically. They want to hear the words of Yahweh. And that's what I hope to do within the four walls of this fellowship. So, the book of um, Acts was written by Rabbi Silas, who came to be known as Lucius, who then went from Lucius to Luca, and then finally to Luke. He was a physician. He was also a, a Jewish rabbi. Um, it is widely understood, uh, though it is uh, inaccurate, that he is, a, he is one of the Gentiles, one of the, one of the Gentiles within the the community of Israel, and there's reasons why we believe that he was a rabbi and not a Gentile. Um, in fact, up until this chapter, most of the people who are in the Nazarene sect of the Jews are Jews or the Hellenized Jews. Uh, recently, we've had Samaritans be converted, but these guys were descendants of the ten tribes. So these guys have kind of already had their foot in, the, in this sort of stuff anyway, even though they're living like Gentiles. But it's not until this chapter we get people that are completely from the other side of the river. And that's who we are. We're Hebrews. Ivrim in Hebrew, which means people on the other side. Uh, literally, people on the other side of the, of the water, the body of water. So, let's have a look. And as you can see by the slides we have here today, we have the um, picture, which kind of is uh, the, the main picture. Um, incident that occurs in this Pasha which is Kepha, otherwise known as Peter and he is on the roof of Shimon the Tanner who we found out last week would almost have certainly also been a rabbi why is that? Because he was a, uh, a Jewish Tanner and Jewish Tanners were employed to make uh, leather, predominantly to make uh, phylacteries prayer phylacteries, so these guys would have had to have known their Torah and be quite well versed. Most kosher butchers you meet, orthodox kosher, kosher butchers you meet, are technically they're trained rabbis as well. So uh, it's, it's interesting. So he's on the roof, and where he, is he? Is in Joppa or Joppa? Uh, Joppa is a, a town um, which is outside Jerusalem, within Israel, and it's just kind of down a little bit from Caesarea, which is where we're going to be today. We're going to be <coughs> the the, the um, city port of Caesarea, and I've been to Caesarea. And I have to say that it was a beautiful place. A lot of the ruins there are still intact. You still have several Roman amphitheaters there. You have a Colosseum there. And you have uh, a lot of uh, Roman shops with the tiles on the floors of the shops still intact. In fact, I don't know if I did, but I, there are a few t tiles just lying around. I think I might have grabbed a few and threw them in my pocket. They just, yeah. Israel's like that. You can pick up, literally pick up broken pottery when you're on a tour. And it's not theft, it's just laying there. You can just dig a little bit in the dirt and you can find a little lantern. You know those little little lamps? And a, a shard of one that could be a thousand years old. You just sort of pick that up off the ground where you're walking in the tour. Um, and people, you can do that. You can take it, it'll get through customs, no problem at all. And then, bang, you've got your first uh, piece of your little museum you want to start. Uh, so, yeah, so we're in Caesarea today. Let's get into it. Verse 1. Now a certain Ish, Ish is man, a certain man in Caesarea by the name of Cornelius, a centurion from what was called the Italian Regiment or Cohort. Now Caesarea was the chief, chiefly uh, Roman occupied city in Jerusalem. It had its name um, taken... Uh, to mean Caesar, Caesarea. And you see that a lot with people in history who are of massive influence, naming towns after their names. Remember Alexander the Great. Mm. He was notorious for it. He would go to a, a, a new community, conquer it, and would call, he'd call the town Alexandra. And then he'd call the next town Alexandretta. 
And then he'd call the next town Alexandra, Rira, Ra, Ra. They're all variants on Alexander. Um, even in Jerusalem, to try and sate Alexander by not putting up idols of himself inside the, the, the holy place or in the, place in, in the temple area, the Jews agreed that they would name all their male uh, children for the next couple of years, or however many years, Alexander. And he, he bought it. He went, all right, if you name him Alexander, I won't put up any statues of me in your holy place. Good boy. So, so yeah, so this guy was, was a great general and a, and a conqueror. He, he was a friend of the Jew, but he was still, he was still sort of a megalomaniac, you know, in many ways. Um, but, you know, he gets out. Trump, doesn't he? We have Caligula, which comes a few years later. And what does he do? He digs up the remains of Alexander the Great and he dresses in his, his clothes and he pretends he's Alexander the Great. So there's a lot of nutters around. So no, no group or community has a, a franchise on nutters. We, we, we've all got them. Uh, so Caesarea was uh, Caesar's capital. So Caesar wanted this place to be Caesar's capital in the Middle East. So he wanted to call it Caesarea Capitolia. That was the that was what they envisioned. So they had the elite of the elite Roman guardsmen in this city. So that's why you have Cornelius being not only mentioned as a centurion, that meant that he was a man who was in charge of between eighty to a hundred men. Okay? Eighty between eighty to one hundred men he would have charge over. And he was one of these guys that you see with wearing a lot of silver, so these guys were quite rich. Even a Roman legionnaire was, would, was paid very well. He was paid very well, their food was paid for and their accommodation was paid for. So if you're in the Roman army, you were very well off. If you were a centurion, you were very well off. And, and here's something that you might not have known. If you're a centurion, then you've done some pretty heroic stuff in battle. So this guy is pretty tough. Don't think of him... Don't think Monty Python, like a bit of feminine, oh, I'm a Roman. No, this guy was tough. This, this guy was a, a battle veteran, a, a seasoned hard warrior. Uh, the Italian cohort. Now, what is that? Cohort is a regiment. A legion is usually comprised of 10 cohorts or, or uh, regiments. Each cohort was made up of about six uh, centuries. Each century had about 80 men plus the centurion. Okay? So, um, we can see that um, this guy was would have probably been engaged in conflicts against Jerusalem, against uh, the Israelites, uh, not Jerusalem um, particularly, but against Israel. And he would have he was so gentle it wasn't even funny. And we see uh, in Yeshua's ministry another centurion that impressed him, don't we? So we see these very disciplined men with a lot uh, on their shoulders. Um, then his faith is appealing to people of a military mind, people who have, um, uh, know how to take orders and know how to give orders. Okay, so verse 2 says he was a devout man. He was a devout man. Is it a bit louder? Yes. He was uh, a fearer, Yireh Elohim. That means somebody who feared Yahweh. Now this type of fear isn't, but I'm too scared to even do anything. I'm going to go into the fetal position and I can't even think. No, this is a respectful type of uh, thoughts and acts towards the Heavenly Father. When you come up here to read the Torah, it's a privilege to do that. When you come here on Sabbath, Yahweh has allowed you to come here. That's the only mic that's working. Oh, this mic isn't working at all? Excuse me, guys, we have a, an issue with the microphone. Um, so we want to look our very best, we want to speak our very best, we want to have very best speaking voice on and we want to um, know that we're coming into the presence of the Heavenly Father, so we, we kind of don't be casual about it, we try and... As if Prince Charles or, or the Queen or the Queen yeah. Mum or somebody came in here, you know what, even if Barack Obama came in here right now, even though we've got some people in the room that aren't real keen on Barack Obama, you'd kind of be a bit awestruck still. You'd go, oh wow, Barack Obama's here. Uh, I'm not particularly keen on myself, but if you walked in the room, you'd kind of go, whoa, this whole, those whole room's gone up a peg, you know, so it's that type of um, fear. Um, and it was all in his house. So he had, he had people in his house. We're getting into it. What do we say when we say the Shema? You shall love Yahweh with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you shall teach words of Torah to your children. And you'll do it when you're walking on the way, when you're sitting down, when you're getting up. 
So you won't just confine it to when you're at home. You might be on a, you might be in a theme park. You might be watching a movie and you might have an opportunity to nudge your son and say, hey, did you spot the Torah principle in that scene? And he goes, no, Dad, I don't understand. See how he, he had, he had a, a weight with the people who are meek. He said good things about people who are meek of spirit. Where does that remind you? What does that remind you of? So we do that all the time. We can bring Torah into any situation. Even if it's a secular Hollywood movie, we can see Torah aspects in it. Um, he practiced Zadaka. He practiced charity. He gave charity. Make it your custom that whenever you go through a, if it's a drive through and they've got those little things, throw in a 20. You know, make it your custom whenever you're going, not a $20 bill, like a 20 cent piece or, or, or some change or something like that. Make it your custom to become familiar with giving. <coughs> even if it's only a little bit, and give it, like I was saying before, just, yeah, here it goes, yeah. Don't sort of go, oh, you know, we don't <laughs> want to do that. Mm. Um, and so, little things that the Jews do, and I think this is really cool, exactly. whenever they go anywhere, if they're taking their children to school or they're going shopping, they'll make a point of giving zedakah on the way, to, and it adds to the, um, the emphasis of their journey, of what they're doing. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm, on my, I'm, out, I'm going out also to give zedakah, give charity, which I think is a great thing, rather than just going about my own, own needs or desires, or doing my dad's it, it, It's actually said, Jace, that by taking that coin, on that charity run, that, that nothing will happen of you while you are doing that good deed, yeah. which is why they take it with them. Yeah, I didn't want to sort of go that far because okay. some people go, oh, I don't know. But yeah, that's that's what they say. Yeah, they get into a bit more than that. Um, for the benefit of all Israel. So what did he do? He gave charity, not just to any Tom, Dick and Harry. He didn't give money to any cause that was necessarily conflicting with Israel's. And if he could, it would be directly to support Israel. Remember that centurion that met Yeshua? He, he'd funded their synagogue, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So this guy was for sure, Cornelius was for sure, for sure affiliated with the synagogue. Okay? And so he davened. Davened is another word for tefillah, which is prayer. And it's more of a... It's getting into a prayer, isn't it? Because you're moving. You're a flick, your soul's a flickering flame. And our souls are like a flickering flame, ever wanting to edge off our wick to get to the Heavenly Father, aren't they? Sorry, did that look a bit... Yeah. Silver. Okay, I won't do it anymore. Um, gets the message across. Gets the message across. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what did he do? He, he, what message? He did the feel it where he continually. That doesn't mean he prayed all the time. But, but he set times in the day where he prayed and he stuck to them as best he could. He was a soldier. He would be out on campaign. If there was ever a person in a profession where prayer would be an issue, yeah. it would be a soldier, especially a centurion. Uh, but he managed it, didn't he? he managed it. If you if you want something enough, you'll you'll do it. You'll do it. And if you love it, you'll do it. Okay. So there's Caesarea here. There's Joppa. Keep that in mind because Joppa's going to come up in a minute because we're going to very soon. Rabbi Kitha, who the world calls Peter, he's going to come into play. He's going to be into it. And I've got a nice picture of who I thought it would be a good person to be Cornelius, and he's dressed in the centurion armor. There, see that stick there. That stick there was to beat disobedient soldiers. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Um, so there were, you know, these guys, you, you didn't, I've met a warrant officer of discipline where I used to work at RAF Base Glenbrook. And if you got on the wrong side of him, you were in trouble. He was old school. But if, he, if you weren't on the wrong side of him, it was, he was a fa fabulous guy to speak to. He had a lot, loads of stories to tell you. So these guys didn't muck around. This guy wasn't a slacker. Okay, so what have we got here? What have we got in the notes? Pretty much everything I've already covered. Uh, Caesarea was the Roman capital of Judea. Roman capital, I want to stress that. The Italian re regiment was stationed there. Centurion, yeah, yeah, yeah. Centurions were usually soldiers who worked their way up the ranks. Okay, he was a Bene Noah, a God-fearer who lived an exemplary life. Society in many parts of the Roman Empire became so corrupt. And life for many became <coughs> hopeless. <coughs> Uh, not hopeless in that they became destitute, penniless, but they just really didn't feel like there was anything. They just didn't want to keep getting on the merry-go-round. They wanted something more. And, um, and so a lot of them were looking for answers. And the mon monotheist nature of our faith was appealing to some Romans. Some Romans thought we were the first atheists. You know why? Because they come up to a Jew or an Israelite and they would say, oh, 
they would, out of their coat, they would pull little idols and they'd go, this is the God we worship. Which ones, are, which, which ones do you worship? And the, the Jew or the Israelite would say, oh, I don't have my God represented, with my, represented in that form. And so they would go, oh, so you don't really follow a God. They didn't, couldn't get in their heads that just because we didn't keep idols that we pulled out and prayed to, that, you know, that we didn't sort of have a faith. You know, they thought we didn't have a faith just because we didn't do that. So, um, so that's interesting. Now, okay, so is a Noah. What, what the heck is a Noah? Okay, we're going to have a look at that tonight. Have you heard, have you heard um, the term Noahide? Who's, put up your hand if you've heard the term Noahide. I want to see who I'm dealing with. Okay, we've heard. You know what? That's got a bad rap. Being a Noahide, being in any, if you mention the word Noahide to a lot of, a lot of people, they'll go, oh, Noahide's bad. You know why? Because a bunch of fruitcakes a couple of years ago emphasised the, um, the aspect in the Noahide laws about beheading. And they said, oh, if you're a Noahide, you're into beheading, and that's, that's a terrible... You know what? Beheading was actually introduced by guillotine, was actually first introduced by a humanitarian. Because beheading, when you behead somebody by a, by a guillotine, provided the guillotine's working and the broke blade is sharp, it's a quick death. It's a quick death. Especially painless. Sorry? Virtually painless. It is virtually painless. Um, if it's sharp, if the blade's sharp, bang, it's, you're gone. There's, uh, and you could do it with one operator. If you put somebody to death via lethal injection, you know you need a crew of about 10 people. If you put somebody to death by electrocution, you need a crew of about 10 people. And if on the day that the person's um, scheduled to be executed, one of them is sick, it's called off. I'd be like, oh man, just get it over and done with, guys. So, so um, you know, they emphasise all oh, beheading, beheading, you know. But um, the Noahide laws, newsflash for those of you that are, think it's a bit of a negative thing, these are the seven laws that every living creature who is sentient should be abiding by. The Noahide laws are seven laws. Now, they're not enumerated like the Ten Commandments. I just want, before you start flicking open your Bible and, sc and scrolling through Genesis and saying, where's that? I'll stop you right now. They're not enumerated as easily accessibly as the Ten Commandments are. Several times, aren't they? The Ten Commandments, are, you can find them in several locations. But they are there. But you have to look for them. You have to do a bit of study to find them. But they're there. And so the idea behind the seven Noahide laws was every creature after the flood was meant to be at least obedient to these. And they'll do well if they're obedient to these. We know that because when you look at the book of Acts a little bit later, we haven't got that far yet, the only per things that were meant to be incumbent upon a person that walks through this door, uh, there's about three things, isn't there? That refrain from sexual immorality, don't eat food sacrificed to idols, don't murder, um, uh, don't eat blood torn, uh, the limb torn from a, uh, don't drink blood from a, don't ingest or uh, strangle. Ah, uh, that's it, don't eat, yeah, don't drink blood from a, yeah, or strangle an animal, things all, of that nature. All meat had to be properly drained. Yeah, so there was, yeah. A, there's only a couple, there's only a few. And that's all, nothing about the Sabbath. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Although they would keep the Sabbath because if they wanted to hear more, they would come along to synagogue on, or shul on Sabbath, so... That's something you've got to bear in mind too. So though they, there was no there, obligation... There would have been no Sunday things happening. Yeah, I know, I know. But though there would have been, there's no specific obligation to keep Sabbath, they would have just come. And you know what they, they would have come out of? Out of custom, out of tradition. And what does it say in the Netherim Ketavim, the New Testament? It says about Yeshua, it says he went into the synagogue. As was the As tradition. was his custom. Isn't that interesting? I love how it, you start to get find out what's what. Now, so this guy, this Cornelius guy... He was a Ger Hasha. What does a Ger Hasha mean? A Ger Hasha is one of the three principal forms of Noahide, which means a stranger, because Gentile can also be translated as stranger, a stranger near the gates. Whose gates? The gates of those in the covenant, the ones that follow Yeshua, in, in, and they're fully in the covenant. Because remember what um, Yeshua says to the Samaritan woman at the well? You Samaritans don't know who you worship, for we know who we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, of the Yahudim. And there'll always be a lawgiver between their feet, won't there? And they're the royal tribe. They're the royal tribe within the, the wider body. Now, not everybody's a Jew, but everybody's an Israelite, aren't they? But I want to deal principally with this type of guy, this type of guy who's actually within the, the, the protective 
confines of the covenant, but they're still called a dare, a stranger. And so they would sit near the gates as if they would be listening to what the guys in the Sanhedrin were all talking about and discussing. And then they would relate it back to their household and say, oh, this is what's happening this week, or, or this is the latest. So he was a dare and a shove, but guess what? His piety and his prayers and the way he conducted himself had come up as a what? As a memorial. Mm -hmm. As a memorial. Cornelius clearly saw in a vision approximately the ninth hour of the day, three o'clock in the afternoon. So the, the Minka prayers start at noon, which is 12 o'clock. And so three hours from now. So he had been praying for three hours. Ask yourself, what's the longest I've ever prayed? Now, it's not about a competition. I prayed for two days straight and didn't eat and I fainted. No, it's not about that. But we've got to learn to pray through rather than get through praying and, and just, I've had enough, I've done my hard yards, I'm out of here. So you may, you may have to rearrange your day. If you've got things to do, it's probably not a good idea, especially if you have to get back to work. You have to be reasonable. But ask yourself, are you spending enough time in prayer? Are you concentrating enough? Are you, do you have any credence for these times, particular times of prayer that we see emphasized in the book of Acts? The, the Shekharet prayers, the morning prayers, the Minka prayers, the noon prayers, and the uh, Mirav, Mirav, Ma'ariv, Ma Ma that's it, Ma'ariv prayers, they're the evening prayers. And each patriarch, apparently, uh, Jacob introduced the morning prayers, Abraham, no, Abraham the morning prayers, Jacob the evening prayers, and uh, afternoon prayers or noon prayers is uh, for Isaac. And there's verses that support that, supposedly. Okay, so he's been praying for three hours. Well, so if, if somebody prays for an hour, would you, I just want to see a show of hands, would you consider them maybe getting on to being a prayer warrior if they regularly pray for an hour each day? I'd reckon. An hour is a pretty good, regardless of how they're going or, or you know, how much of it is, are they reading out of a sedua? How much of it is conversation? All these things need to be sussed out. So there's things we need to think about when we pray. Not, not so much doing this impromptu prayer while I'm driving my car. I don't mind you doing that every once in a while. But if that's the only... No, that's, that's not good enough driving a car. You need to be concentrating on the road. Okay. And he was fasting. So in, in combination with this prayer, he was fasting, wasn't he? Fasting specifically means refraining from food. I've heard people say, oh, I'm going to fast from playing video games. <laughs> that's de by definition, that's not... You're not fasting. If you're fasting... It's something that is to do with denying yourself edible food substance, yeah? Okay, so he was fasting, and then he saw a vision. He saw a vision. Now, how did he respond to the vision? Was he scared? Was he happy? Did he go, oh, great! Yes! I'm pushed through! Woohoo! Tell me what you're going to say. This is great. No, he was kind of scared, wasn't he? He was kind of scared, and this was a guy... He was a seasoned warrior, and he was quite a skin. I'll get back to this in a minute. I haven't forgotten about this. Uh, verse 4, having looked intently at him and having become afraid, Cornelius said, what is it, Adon? What is it, Lord? What is it, what is it sovereign? And the Malik, which is the angel. Now, Malik is the, is the original words. It means messenger, but we dress it up with ecclesiastical terms, and we call them angels. And it's hard not to think about little fluffy kids with think, but we do our best, right? So it was an angel sent one from Yahweh. He said to him, your prayer and your giving of Zedakah, note both, he acknowledges both, ascended as a Zechoron. Now what's a Zechoron? Cigarette. Ziggurat. The Tower of Babel was a ziggurat. What does a ziggurat mean? It means a protruding structure that draws attention to itself. The generation of Tower of Babel, they wanted, they wanted Yahweh to, say, to see and look and go, look at what we can do. We can build a building so high that if you ever flood the earth again, we'll still live because we'll just go right to the top of the building. Look at our cigarette. That's where you get the term cigarette. And so his prayers have got attention, haven't they? Like the, the generation of the Tower of Babel, but for different reasons, for better reasons, isn't it? So, so they've come up as a ziggurat before Elohim. Hashem just means the name. Elohim means mighty one. It's usually when we read God, it should be mighty one every now. Elohim. Verse 5, now dispatch some Anashim, some men to Jaffa, and send for a certain Shimon, who is also called Kepha. 
Okay, so he's giving him a command, isn't he? He's giving him a command. Now, just let me backtrack for a moment. The, the times to pray, um, if you want to have a scriptural source for your time to pray, Psalms 55 verse 17, jot that down. If you have a friend that says, oh, where does it say I should pray three times a day? That's generally considered our, our first port of call to support that. Now, this is interesting. Um, your, your prayer has come up as an ascendant to Elohim. So our, our prayer is like a sweet smelling incense to the Heavenly Father. Oh, I know that's something else. I haven't got there yet. Okay, so the angel is telling him to do something. Is the angel telling him you're saved? Is he turning up and saying, Oh, by the way, Camille, it's just letting you know, and you'll be happy to hear this, you and your whole household are saved because of you're a pious man. No. He's not giving him that message. In fact, he's not even giving him any message. He's telling him, you need to go and do something and you'll get some, you'll get, you'll find out what I, what I want you to do when you, you do this. Turn to 1 Peter. Turn to 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 12. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 12. Now, this is really interesting because what a lot of us tend to do is where we're mainly concerned throughout any given day that we avoid hell. And what we don't tend to think about is that in the future there'll come a time when we'll be judging angels. And, and usually when we get in a legal uh, tangle on earth, we'll sometimes go to a secular uh, judicial system to get it sorted out rather than trying to get it ironed out ourselves. You know, if we're going through a divorce or there's some issue with ownership of something, we'll go to non-Israelites, non-people, non-Torah body people to get something sorted. And so we're finding that we can't even run with foot soldiers. So how are we ever expected to run with horsemen? So we need to we need to do, get so the training we, sorted Peter. out. So so one Peter, one uh, verse chapter one verse twelve. One Peter. one Peter chapter one verse twelve. And look at this. This is really interesting. Same. If I can find it. Ah, okay. Verse twelve. It was revealed to them that their service when they spoke about these things were not for their own benefit, but for yours. Who's it talking about here? It's talking about the prophets. As these same things have now been proclaimed to you by those who communicated the basar, the full messianic message, the good news, the devar, the tov devar. Tov means good in Hebrew. To and through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit sent from Shemayim, heaven. Now here it is. Even the angels long to look into these things. Wow. Isn't that amazing? But by the way, basar means meat. Basar? Basar means meat. There you go. Not 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 um full message means meat. Basor. Basor. You said basar. Oh sorry, basar. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just correct me on the pronunciation. Don't freak me out. Okay. Um so what happens when you go to an election? You go to vote. Dallas, what happens when you go to an election? You go to an election, right? And the people in the election that is running the election, are they? do they influence you in any way? And I'm not talking about the ones near the gate who give you their pamphlets. Do they go, you know what, I'd, I'd go that box. They just give you the material, don't they? They come in, they take your name down, tick you off, you voted, they direct you to a booth, and they help you in any way practicable to do anything. <coughs> but they won't steer you to do any specific thing. An angel... His role largely is to do that. You know what we learn from that practically? When we're sharing the word of Yahweh to somebody, we're really just a mouthpiece. Okay, it's great if we can identify with who we're talking to, we can talk a bit of footy to get the conversation started. That's why it's important to watch the footy, to watch your state of origin. <laughs> it is. It, it gives you, you know, it gives you a little, oh, I don't watch that. You know, you, oh, what a sour puss. You know, have you got time to at least watch that? You know. Be anyway, sorry. Couldn't be bothered. Couldn't be bothered. But um, you know, I'm interested in medicine. Let's talk about healing from. You know. Anyway, you'll find something. There's something. But the angels and us, we're just meant to present the message. We try not to push the point. You could argue that that's what Cora did, didn't you? Cora was wanting everybody to be a prophet, which was what Moshe wanted. Remember, Moshe says, I'm happy that everybody be a prophet. 
the Quora was co- trying to just push things before they were ready to happen, weren't they? And he revolted, he rebelled. You know what the big thing problem with Cora was? It's not necessarily that he rebelled or caused division. It's that he misinterpreted the prophecies that he was getting because he was getting these prophecies that his lineage would go on to be great, go on to greatness. And so when he showed up the next morning with his fry pan, he was like, he was so convinced that he was going to stay alive and Moshe was going to get swallowed up because he was misinterpreting the information that Yahweh is. That's what error does. When error starts to creep into your life, you might get the right information, but you might misinterpret it. And that was that was his biggest issue. Had he had he um, been a little bit more standoffish about interpreting and been able to interpret it right, he might have gone, you know what, I'm not confident. I'm not happy with Moshe and the way he's making Aaron and his brother and him do everything, but I'm not confident enough to show up with my fry pan, so I'm not going to. And it was his misinterpretation of prophecy that pushed him to stay there and be determined to do it. So it's something that's an aspect of Korah. The, sa- the sages say, the sages say that his wife got into his ear. Yeah, his wife did get into his ear. We'll, we'll have a discussion. Yeah. If it's all right, if I let you speak, then I'll open it up, and we'll never get through this. Um, but we will. Yeah, you're right. His wife did get into his ear as well, and that's in the scriptures. Okay, verse seven. And when the angel or the Malik, the messenger speaking to him, had departed, Cornelius summoned Shemayim of his household. Oh, so he's basically said, sorry, let's skip verse 6. This one is staying with a certain Shimon the town, whose house is by the sea. And he says, and then the, the angel speaking to him had departed, Cornelius summoned men of his household, a devout uh, soldier from among the ones of his service, and having explained everything to them, sent them to Jaffa. So it's a given that the angel basically told them the address, as we know, the scriptures aren't a play-by-play. They're just giving us highlights at times, and they'll give you detail where it feels it needs to give you detail. Bang! To Kepha. Above the tanner's house. Very hungry. He could probably eat a horse, but he keeps kosher saying, wait, oh, we're going to talk about that in a second. And he's praying. What does it say? Verse 9, on the next day, as these were travelling and drawing near to to Jaffa, um, these were those sent by Cornelius, around the sixth hour noon, Kepha went up onto the roof to pray. And Kepha became hungry and was wanting to have a meal. But while they were preparing it, Kepha fell into a trance. Fell into a trance. Has anybody here ever fallen into a trance? You can put up your hand if you have. I haven't. I don't think I have. No one? Okay, so we're, we're kind of going to have to go on hearsay here. Some people confused, mate. So there you go. <laughs> Brother Bruce has been accused of being in a trance, but, you know, we won't go there. I've done it with a low fed when I was in it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so he's in a trance. So we're just going to have to take all the definitions we read about trances on Wikipedia or wherever in the encyclopedia for a given there. So he's in some sort of a trance. So it's stressing that he's not in a normal state of semblance. He's not, you know, he's, he's kind of... He's in a 50-50 place. He's partly here and he's partly in the spiritual realm. Okay, so Caesarea is about three, 30 miles from Jaffa. It was about noon. It's likely um, that Cornelius' men got there on horseback. This indicates urgency that Cornelius sensed in his message. Remember, he... Uh, oh, no, we haven't got there yet, so you can't remember it. We haven't done it yet. Excuse me. Yahweh is working on both ends of the divine connection. See that? Yeah. He's working on both ends of the divine connection. He he's not knows. giving you the game. No. But he's giving you enough for you to join the dots. You know what? Scripture study works like that as well. When you study the scriptures, you you have to do a little bit of work to join the dots in certain places. And that's the whole idea of it. We don't practice sorcery. You don't get a magic. You don't get a new magical ability every time you've graduated and read another book. You need to you need to start to join the dots, and it's, it's a slow process. It's a slow process. No, I said. Rabbi Keith at this point had become second in command of the messianic community. Who was first in command? Jesus. Yes. She always gets them right. Yaakov Hazadik, James the Just, Yeshua, otherwise known as Jesus. Yeshua's brother is the head of the movement. Now this guy, Rabbi Kiefer, and who's Rabbi Kiefer? Mike, what did this guy do that was so naughty? 
He renounced Yeshua three times, didn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm done with oh. Peter not knowing. Oh, sorry, Peter. I should have said Thank Peter. You. Thank you. Thank my, you. My bad. I should have said Peter. Now, this guy renounced Yeshua in his hearing, in his earshot, three times. So do you think his test shoot is going okay? Yes. Why? Because he's the second in charge of Yeshua's uh, ministry or, or sect of Judaism. Or, you know, the Nazarenes, if you want to more comfortable calling that. And so he's the most, he's the second most vocal mouthpiece. Most encouraging to all of us who make mistakes. Exactly. So see what, no, but what I'm saying right, is that he's doing, his life has become returned. It's Teshuva, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Shaul, who the world calls the Apostle Paul, he was so prominent in his ministry after his transition on the road to Damascus because he was an absolute killer of the community. He was like wild boar tearing up a vineyard. So he was so devastating to our community that he knew that now he's on the other side and he's doing the things that he should be doing right now, he's going to be as just effective, if not more, doing the right work of the Heavenly yeah. Father now as opposed to the wrong. Yeah. So, but a lot of people say, oh, Shaul doesn't talk much about repentance, so maybe it's not that important. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, then you're missing the point. It is really important with him because it's his words, it's his whole ministry that's speaking in volumes that is a lot louder than anything you could ever say. He does speak about repentance about five, four or five places, but it's his life, it's his, what's it. happening, he's living it, yeah. There was a brilliant uh, comment by a Christian I heard once, and he said, I like to preach the gospel, and sometimes I use words. Yeah. That's fantastic, I love that. That's that's superb, you know, you can, you can live it, it's gonna speak in his volumes. And not exhibit it, like blow a trumpet, look, I'm giving charity. Just do what you, you need to do. While Cornelius received an open vision, which allowed him to see into the invisible world, Rabbi Kiefer received a vision while in a trance. And guess what? Rabbi Kiefer, he doesn't even get... It's not handed to him as much on a silver platter. He sees an allegory, doesn't he? He's about to see something that's a symbol. and has symbolism to it. Even if you believe it's a scene that tells you that you can eat anything, you can still sort of say, oh, there's symbolism there. Do you know what I mean? Even if you had that wrong understanding of what's about to happen. So he's getting symbolism where Cornelius just gets an angel saying, oh, I need you to send men to go down to see this guy. You know what I mean? He's just telling him straight. So isn't it interesting how Yahweh will approach us in the level that we're at? Because he's using his hunger to stimulate what, what he needs to ground into, into Rabbi Kiefer. Because up until this point, guys, and I, and I know you probably don't want to hear this, you didn't get Gentiles coming into the complete Gentiles, they were called proselytes, that hardly, if ever, happened. Up until now, Stephen wasn't a Gentile, he was a Hellenized Jew. That means one of his parents would have been a Gentile. And he was of the Hellenist Jew fraternity, Philip, Pinhas. Philip, he was a Hellenized Jew. That means they were Jews, but they looked very Greek. Now we're up to they're casting the net outward bound. This is it. This is where it hits the ground running with this chapter. So he's, he's about, something's about to happen. Okay, so he sees this vision. It's also for me the way God deals with the individual, with the Greek mind of the yes. centurion. He yes. spelled it out. Whack, 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 one, two, three. With the, the Jewish mind. But giving him contrary to yeah, he talks he talks in whatever level you're at yeah. you know I, I talked to my boy how I talked to Joshua in a way that I talked differently to, to my wife so it's, it's sort of a bit like so verse 11 and he sees the Shemayim the heavens having been opened and a certain object descending like a large linen cloth lowered by four corners of ponds Haretz the earth you know why I know that a Haretz means the earth because when we say the blessing over food that grows out of the ground I always say Haretz it's good to, when you start learning your blessings, even if it's one Hebrew word, you might recognize it and it'll start to pop up in other places. In, in verse 12, in this were all the four footed animals and the creepers of the earth and of the birds of the, the sky. Sometimes you can, it's not, you know, we read the word heaven and we go, oh, heaven. Most of the times you read the word heaven, it just means sky or skies. Verse 13, and there came a voice to him. Get up, Kepha! Kill and eat! So Kepha said, Kalalili! Far be it from me, Adonai! 
For I've never eaten basopikul. I've never eaten anything unclean. So if you think Yeshua did away with the kosher laws, don't you think Kefir would have been abiding by that now? Because he's been and gone. He's coming back as a warlord. So Kefir's still keeping kosher, isn't he? Yeshua's come and his, his suffering arm of his ministry has come and it's finished. It's come and gone. Now he's coming back as a warrior. If he was going to change the law of, of animals, eating unclean animals, surely Kefir, second in the Netzerim movement at this time, he would have been abiding by it. No, he said, I'll never... But he's thinking, maybe this is a change now. Maybe I, maybe I can eat anything I want now. Maybe I can eat whatever's permissible as food now. Let's have a look. And there came a loud, uh, and there came a back call, uh, a voice to Kefir, again for a second time, what Elohim made tahor, clean, you should no longer regard as tamer, which is unclean. So that's two times. That's two times. When Joseph went to Pharaoh, how many times did he have these dreams repeated? Two times. That means it's going to happen soon. You're going to have a famine here pretty soon. So this is going to happen soon, isn't it? The men are already on their way. We're going to Joppa. Come on. Okay. And this happened three times. Oh, sorry, three times. That's right. Three times the number of um, permanency. Uh, Pharaoh's dream, I think, is only two, though. <coughs> anyway, if it's multiple, if it's multiple times, it means it's going to happen sooner. Two or three witnesses to establish the truth. The David just said two or three witnesses to establish the truth. Thank you. You got me out of that one. Um, and this happened three times, and immediately the object was taken back up into the sky. Okay, now let's let's have a look at kosher. Can I eat a giraffe? Yes. Yes, I can. Why? Because it's got a split hoof. And it's got a big appetite. It's got a big appetite. Oh, Shut the lid. Is it that obvious? Now, can I eat a buffalo? Yes. Yeah, because it's a type of cow. Can I eat a water buffalo? Yes. yes. Can I eat a hawk? No. no. Bird of prey. Now, how many animals in the insect realm can I eat? How many different species? No. I think one's a fly. I think it's four or five. Out of all the entire species of insects, there's only about four or five types of insects. I'm not 100 percent sure that you can eat two of those in different species of locust. So what are we learning from that? The insect world's pretty murky, so it's very few and far between what we're able to eat from there. Now, uh, uh, sea life. Can I eat a shark? No. You have to be very careful, boys and girls. If you go into a fish and chip shop, most of what they sell you as fish is shark. So just ask them, just say, oh, do you know where this fish is from? Do you know what type of fish it is? A lot of them haven't got a clue, or they lie. Um, if you go to a, um, a Lebanese kebab shop, usually you're okay if it's as if you can see Lebanese people are running it, even if they do sell pork, pork, pork products, um, that you, you'll be generally okay, but you do, might still have to ask. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, we can't eat. Um, what about prawns? Can we eat prawns? No. No, we can't eat prawns. Cockroach of the sea. It is. It's a, it's like a, any animals that are kind of scavengers or eat feces or whatever. When Yahweh says, yeah, no, I kind of don't want you to do that. It's not going to be fitting for you to do that. Um, birds of prey, um, scavengers. We don't generally eat any of those. So we need to slowly become familiar, and it's not a hassle. I, I actually personally, I, I actually find that keeping kosher. Um, I will sometimes slip up if I'm at a party, but I'll quickly rectify it and wash my mouth out. Um, I find that actually some of the easiest things to do to please Yahweh. Um, you know, I miss eating prawns. I used to love eating prawns, but really, it's it's one of the easier things I've found. You know, it's and um, it, it's uh, a lot of people go, oh, you can kind of eat whatever you like. You know, shellfish. Can you eat shellfish? No. Which is. Um, yeah, you can't eat shellfish. It's got to have fins, and it's got to have um, scales. Yahweh, and, and you know when you read in Leviticus, it says, and after species of its kind. So it means any type of species that are of that branch of species, you may not also eat. Now what does it say? What's the translation that we read? It's an abomination. <laughs> Do you remember? It's an abomination. So it's not something that's just bad. It's an abomination. What happened in the garden? What happened in the garden? Yahweh says you can eat 
always stopped for me. See that tree over there? I don't want you to eat of that tree. Now the tree that he told Adam and Harbour not to eat out of, was that food edible? Yes. Was it also good for the people? Like in terms of giving them nutrients there and then? Yes, because remember the verse says, Hava or Eve looked and saw it was good to eat. Pork is very high in protein, did you know that? Pork is actually very high in protein. So it wasn't that the food was actually good for you, physically, he's just told you not to eat it. I just said, I don't, yeah, I know this, but I just don't want you to eat it. Now you can do all your research and find out that a pig has the same cardiovascular system as a human. And therefore, the flesh of a pig is only about 4% shy of different than the flesh of a human. That's why we have pig organs, not ape, ape organs, put into us. So it's, it's close to cannibalism if you eat pig. Uh, and you can do all that and go, oh yeah, there's tetranella spirals in pig, and they cause um, staph infection. You can do all that, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, he just said, don't eat it. So then we go, okay, you're right, you said, he knows best. I'm not going to eat it. It's not going to kill me not to eat it. So if you should find, if science catches up to Torah, and we, yeah, we're finding it all the time, don't we? Science and the medical world always catches up to Torah. Bruce finds out about it every week. Just about everything. That, oh, there's this new breakthrough. Oh, what is it? Oh, yeah, you know what? They kind of already knew that. You know, they, we're all, the, the secular world are always catching up. And so I've seen jotting down notes of that slide here. That's Luke and Shoya Chabad. Um, I'll, um, can I go on to the next slide or I'll, you're still taking notes for us? No worries. So, so um, back to this, we still have this Cornelius guy dispatching men from his household and he is a stranger near the gates and he's heading toward this. Again, as I did, he's wanting to come closer into the covenant and his stage of approach is gaining, uh, is getting close, edging closer all the time. So by the end of this, He'll be a Gerizadi, which basically means that he's fully in the covenant anyway. He's done the roof. He's, he's taken the Ruthite um, pledge. Uh, verse 17. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed within himself as to what the vision which he saw might be, Hanani, behold, and men who had been sent by Cornelius, who had been by inquiring, found the house of Shimon, stood at the gate. So, ladies and gentlemen, has Kiefer fully understood the vision yet? No. He's no. still mulling it over, isn't he? I reckon you'd be a bit stressed. Because yeah. you'd be going, I hope this isn't what I think it means because the Torah never changes and this is a change. This is a change coming on right now. So he'd be getting pretty frightened. The goalposts are being moved. That's not on. Heavenly Father, that's a, that's just such an obvious goalpost. It's not funny. You've never done that before in the history of your interaction with, with mankind. What, you know, you'd kind of be going down that road. Uh, and in calling out, they were asking for Shimon, and one called Kiefer uh, is staying here. While Kiefer was reflecting on the vision, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Again, there's that number of three. But get up and go downstairs and accompany them without apprehensions, for I myself have sent them. One of them's a Roman officer. Can I just tell you something? When a Roman sends for a Jew in this day and age, it's usually not a good thing. <laughs> So, so Kiefer needed some prompting with that vision, didn't he? If you get sent for by somebody from Rome, you ain't probably come. Kiss your kids goodbye because you ain't probably coming back. Um, Rabbi Kiefer understood the vision was symbolic in nature, was pondering its interpretation. He knew that he knew that much. Yahweh was about to give Rabbi Kiefer the interpretation. If the Lord had not told Rabbi Kiefer he had sent them in, Rabbi Kiefer would not would have had a very difficult time receiving Romans. So Yeshua didn't even dine with fully-fledged pagans. He dined with sinners. Mm -hmm. So what would that have meant? A lot of the sinners he dined with would have probably been Jewish. But they were sinners. They were harlots and tax collectors. So this is kind of even a new thing that's happening even in this time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. these, are, these are people that are fully-fledged pagans. They're, they're not, they've got no relation to this, this nation, yet they're finding that they're having a, 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 a pulling towards it. This chapter is so important. I'm so glad there's a few people here today. Uh, 21. And Kiefer went downstairs to the men and said, Behold, I am the one whom you are seeking. For what reason did you come? He's still got to go through the motions. And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, um, a righteous man, Ishus man, Zadik, is righteous, uh, a Yit Elohim, a fearer of Yahweh, uh, with a Shem Tov, with a good name. He has a good name. Shem is name, Tov is good. Uh, with all the uh, Yehudeh, all the Israelites, all the, the people of Israel, 
um, was directed by a Melech Kadosh Setapart messenger to summon you to his bait or base to hear the house to hear the message from you. Ah, okay. So now Kiva's going, okay, so I've got to come and share you guys this message that I've since been preaching to lost Israel, which are Samaritans, and we know people are descendants of lost tribes, and to Jews. Now I've got to go completely into alien territory? Oh, okay. Verse 23. Therefore, having invited them in, Kiva gave them hospitality and lodging. On the next day, Kiva got up and he went away with them. Some of their brothers in Mashiach with Kiva went with him to... Um, to Jaffa. To, now, why did that have to happen? He needed people to be with him to watch his back and to be witness to what was going to happen. You may have had a scribe amongst them as well. But also so, be a witness to what they had seen with Yeshua. Exactly. Yeah. So it's keeping it all above board. Mm. And you've got to remember, and I, and I brought it up with Brother Andrew today, he's called ultra-Orthodox. Do you remember a few weeks ago, the Netzerim were persecuted and they were pushed out of Jerusalem except for the Apostles. The apostles, they suffered the apostles to stay. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they allowed the, the leaders to stay and they didn't do them that much harm after they saw that the people of the influence were leaving. Because they were so they were as orthodox as the Jews that didn't accept Yeshua. So they could still have interaction with them. And I said to, to Andrew, it's like in the Lubavitcher movement. You remember the Chabad guys? Some of them accept Shnusen as the Messiah. Some of them do, and they're wrong. Some of them within the Chabad movement don't, yet they can still hang out. That's the easiest way I can describe it to you. And that's what's happening here. Yeah? And so he's bringing with him other... And you, this never really happened. You didn't... The Orthodox guys never went into the, the house of a Roman letter writer, someone who was fairly rich like this centurion. Eating with lodging with pagans would have been strictly forbidden to him according to the customs of current Judaism. Rabbi Kippur would certainly take six credible witnesses with him to Caesarea so that they would be a witness to these men uh, were Ger, Peshav, uh, converts to Judaism. Sometimes it's better if I just stick to the slide, isn't it? Verse 24. And on the following day, Messiah's Shalukim sent ones, Shimon Kippur, Simon Kippur, uh, entered Peter, entered into Caesarea and Cornelius was expecting them. Having called together his uh, whole family, the family that were related to him, and close friends. Now, when it came about that Keeper entered, Cornelius met him falling on his feet to pay him reverence. What happens? Keeper made him stand up, saying, Get up, I myself am only a son of Adam like everyone else. If you read son of Adam in the Bible, that basically means I'm a human being. Okay, so if you say you're a son of Adam, you're saying in, in archaic terms, I'm just a human being. Um, they apparently had spent the night somewhere along the way. This is um, Kiefer and his three, six witnesses and uh, those uh, from Caiaphas, um, Cornelius' household. Uh, Cornelius had faith, faith enough in what the angel told him and called together his relatives. So he got his whole relatives around there. So wouldn't you do that? You get your, if you knew you were going to have a guy who was an awesome speaker and was full of the spirit come over to your house... You'd be a bit sneaky and get some of your some of your relays. And you know which ones you'd pick? You'd pick the relays in your family you know you know would have the most influence. If everybody has people like that in their family, there's one or two that they're always the life of the party or they just seem to be all, be everyone agrees with whatever they say. So so you get them over and he did. Um, bowing down showed deep reverence to those to these men um, had for a Zadik, a righteous one, they were not usual Romans. Rabbi Kippur was not about to take the glory that belonged to Yahweh, so he says, get up, don't worship me. And we see angels do that all the time, don't they? You know, the apostles get down on their knees. Get up, get up, I'm only an angel. Uh, and as they converse with Cornelius, Kippur entered and finds many have assembled. So uh, having met, uh, sorry, many having assembled. And he said to them, you have knowledge, the ark is knowledge, that it is prohibited for uh, a Jewish man to associate or with or to approach a foreigner. And yet to me, Yahweh of him showed to call no one an abomination or unclean. So what are we learning? Yahweh is not a respecter of persons. No. Yahweh is not a respecter of persons. You know what I found out about Orthodox Judaism? They actually believe 
that if somebody has absolutely no ancestry or no lineage to any Abrahamic line or any Jewish tribe or, 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 or any type of Jewishness, they believe that that is a Jewish soul. Uh, bear with me, this is what they say, but it, there's, I, I like the logic behind it. They say that is actually like a, that, that soul is a Jewish soul, but it is such a, such a profound soul that it's been put in a place that is even a harder journey set before it. So it's been brought up into a family of gear of strangers. So that person has the same distinction as, as a proper born Jew, mm. but they're given even more respect because they must have been such an awesome uh, uh, nephesh in heaven that when that soul was transposed into a heavenly body, you know, I said, well, I'm going to give you a task that's in accordance with your ability. You know what I mean? Because you can argue somebody that's brought up in a Jewish household, they have an advantage. That's why Shaul, who the world calls the Apostle Paul, says, what advantage has the Jew? What advantage is there in the circumcision much in every way? Because they've kind of already know about the stuff. So that's interesting, isn't it? I think that, that that's amazes me. It goes against you, you kind of, oh, you know, if you, if you read some of their, their writing, you go, oh, okay, they're not quite the crackpots I've thought they, they have been, you know, with all their Talmudic stuff and everything. So that increases their responsibility also. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? You're meant to, if you're a proselyte and you converted from a Noahide into the full covenant, even if you're a Noahide, they're meant to give you the same respect, if not more, than a fellow bro rabbi or brother and sister. And most Jewish communities will have Noahides living within their community. We went, I went to a synagogue with David and they had a Noah, Noahide. He's a Noahide. He only keeps the seven laws of Noah. He's not a Jew. Is he a Jew? Which one? The guy that... It, it, um, that synagogue that you took me to was here. Do you know? I think oh, it was a Jew, uh, Ellie Collins one. Yeah. Yeah, but Asian guy. Yeah. 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 No, no, not him. The other. Guy. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But he. <laughs> but you know what they have him there for? To to just on Sabbath he can do stuff that they don't, can't necessarily do. And he's a, he's a guy that's still got salvation. He's a guy that's still got salvation. Yeah? According to. Well, according to Acts, when it says no other obligation will be put upon the, apart from these three or four things, are they still saved? Yeah. But guess what? If it's Sabbath. Now, I'm going to probably get them to put a turn of light bulb, bulb on over me because I've moved into the covenant a little bit further than them. Now, they are going to get here what, where I get eventually. It's when you keep them there, that's when it's wrong. I'm going to keep him around forever so he can turn the oven on for me. Now, that's wrong if you're going to do if that's your intention. So, because you kind of go, wow, it's interesting. They have a lot of people at different stages and it becomes very practical. Um, Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was governing, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, uh, a being stood before me in robed in shining radiance. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer was heard, and your zedek is remembered before Hashem, Yahweh. Therefore, send to Jaffa and summon Simon, who is called Kepha. Uh, he is staying in the house of Shimon the Tanner by the sea. At once I sent for you, and you did well having come. Now, therefore, we will all... And we all are present before Yahweh or Hashem to hear all the things that have been commanded to you by Adonai. So they're saying, come on, we've got willing ears. Speak to us. Speak to us. And opening his mouth, Peter said, Amen. I have knowledge that Elohim is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the ones who have fear of heaven and work righteousness before Elohim are accepted to him. Wow. So Keith has now finally come to the understanding of that rooftop vision. It's not talking about unclean animals now being ready to eat. It's what is it what is a tully? They come down in a sheet. It's a four cornered garment. What's a four cornered garment? It's a talit. A talit is your tabernacle, because every person's a temple, your body is a temple. So this is the this is the tent that goes over the tabernacle. That's why usually you wear it when you when you're praying. And so there, it's talking about people, not food. But it's using his extreme hunger. Mm -hmm. Yahweh's using his extreme hunger to teach him a lesson. These look unclean to you, but they're not. They just come from a different place. But they're they're like you. They're the same as you. And so his his whole theology is being challenged. These witnesses he's brought with him, they're shocked. And you'll read how they're shocked in a second in the text. So, this was considered to be true among the Jews. What's that? Rabbi Kippur was now, is understanding Yahweh does not show partiality. Now, Yahweh is showing him it is true among all men to the Jewish mind of the day. This was a radical concept. 
the divine, the word which was sent to Bnei Israel, preaching shalom, peace through King Messiah Yeshua, our teacher. You know the thing which took place throughout Judah, having begun from Galilee after the, the, the prayers and repentance which John the Baptist preached. I'm just doing it so you know what I'm talking about. You know King Messiah Yeshua from Nazareth, how Elohim anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, uh, and how he went about doing mitzvot, commandments, love deeds, and giving Rafu Shalema, health and healing to all the ones being oppressed by Samael. Samael is another name for the devil or the adversary because Elohim was with him. So he's preaching to them the good news, the gospels. Man, you hear, you're watching it, you're reading it, you're seeing it. This is happening, and, and this, is, this is one of the earliest documented episodes we see of people who have before now lived foreign lifestyles. They're learning a little bit from their local synagogue, but now, and, and they're open to the message of Yeshua, because up until this point, they've only got it from the Orthodox Jews who don't necessarily accept Messiah, haven't they? So now they're getting it with the proper understanding. So this, that's what's amazing to me. Uh, verse 39, we, witnesses of, we are witnesses of all these things, which he did both in the countryside of Judah and Jerusalem. He's telling them, he said, we saw these things. And they also put him to the death, having hanged him on a tree, according to Deuteronomy, the curse in Deuteronomy 21, 23. This one Elohim made to stand up alive again on the third day and, he grant, and granted to him to be visible, not, not to all Israel, but to witnesses. So that's an indication there. He didn't appear to all Israel like the Mount Sinai incident was to, in front of all Israel. He only appeared to witnesses. Some of them could have been foreigners which had been chosen beforehand by Elohim, that is to us who ate and drank together with him at the resurrection of Messiah. Uh, after the resurrection of Messiah, excuse me. So he's referring to 12 apostles. There's a minimum of 500 eyewitnesses. 42 Rebbe, Melech, Hamashiach, our master teacher, Messiah Yeshua, gave, loved thee, gave a love deed to us to preach to the people and to bear his testimony that this one is the one having been appointed by Elohim as judge of the living and the dead. Isn't that interesting? He judges the living and the dead. So there will be those that don't face death. Otherwise, it's just the living over all the dead, isn't it? Um, to, uh, 43, to this one, all the prophets bear witness that through Hashem, the mighty name of him, everyone has faith in, who has faith in him has forgiveness of Averos, which is, uh, Averos is sin in Hebrew, People were still speaking these words when the Ruach HaKadosh fell upon the ones here in the Bible. Now this is what I'm going to leave you with today. This is what this is another thing that should knock your socks off. According to what we've learned up until now, you have to be immersed in water, and there's a whole lot of other things that happen. Then, if you're lucky, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit might fall on you. We're not here. These guys haven't been immersed yet. What's happening? The Holy Spirit's falling on you now. That's just... That's not in the brochure. It's not in the brochure. Isn't that amazing? Now, now they get immersed in a minute. Whoa! This is this should knock your socks off. Um, and the Messianic Jews. Now, you know how historically I've always said I hate the term Messianic Jew because it's a tautology. I have no problem with the term Messianic Jew when you're talking about uh, Jews who don't accept Messiah as opposed to Jews that do. I think that has a place. That's so, again, please. I have no, the Mess, Messianic Judaism, I don't really like that term because Judaism means, the word Judaism actually means Messianic, uh, it's to do with the term it's Messianic in nature. It's Messianic in nature, right? so I don't like it. But, if you're talking about Jews who do accept Messiah and Jews who don't, if you want to cause a distinction between the two, I think Messianic Jews definitely has a place. Yeah? I think that term, that term in that environment does have a place, so I'm just correcting myself. And so what is the other context where you don't agree with this? Well, if you say Messianic Judaism, you're saying that Judaism on its own doesn't accept a Messiah concept, but it does. Um, you know in the Siddur today? I love the Siddur. We read, we quoted it, a prominent rabbi, and we all went our main, so, so we're all cool with it. Uh, and... Um, here it is. It says, in the principles of the faith, and this is the Rambam, in his principles of the faith that are manifest. I believe, and this is an Orthodox Jew who never saw Messiah, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of Messiah, ever how long it takes, I will await his coming every single day. 
that is proper Judaism. Now, there are some nutcases out there that say Judaism doesn't believe in the concept of the Messiah. They're just idiots. Um, the, real, the real ones, you know, the real, real Judaism is all Jews are away from Messiah. That's why the Chabad movement is so influential. They're going, oh, Messiah, Messiah. When you go to a, if you ever go to a Chabad house, which none of us probably ever will, they're all going, bring Mashiach, no, bring Mashiach. They're very, um, they're almost they're Pentecostal. Kind of like large Christians. Yeah. Like uh, in, fact, I'll, in fact, I'll tell you a quick story, a quick story. This is really interesting. <laughs> now, Jason, quick. No, 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 no. Listen, this, is, this will blow you off. Many people know that Rabbi Rob studied with the Lubavitches. And he was at the, he was at the Chabad house in Temple, Texas, or wherever it was in, in Waco, Waco, Texas, was it? Thank you. Excuse me, and I don't understand what a Chabad house is. A Chabad house is like a, um, it's like a synagogue. It's like a place where they, but it's... No, it's, it's more a like... Uh, it's a house of study. The, the, the best way to describe a Chabad house, we say, here all around the world, is it's like a YMCA for, for That's Jews. That's a perfect example. Yeah, it's a YMCA. Okay. And this is a sect within Judaism it's that are known... It's a pseudo-religious... Well, it's happening. well, it's so completely it's religious, but there. it's yeah. yeah go on, I, I, and they, these guys are really, the these guys are really orthodox. Anyway, yeah, it was on Yom Kippur. It was on Yom Kippur, and they'd been praying all day. And as the day wore on, their prayers built to a crescendo, and they all started to sing this song that they always sing. And it was yeah, 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 something yeah, yeah, and that's the closest they ever get to saying mm. the name in public. Mm. And what happened was, and Rob was there with his handler because you have a handler. When you, if you want to get involved with this stuff, they make sure you, you're with a partner and he tells you what's going on. And he, and, and they started to, to just babble in this weird speech. And he could tell it wasn't Hebrew. And his handler turned to him and said, Rabbi, don't be frightened of what's happening now. They're, they're speaking in soft, which means they're incomprehensibly speaking. Incomprehensibly speaking. Comprehensibly speaking. Gotcha. And he goes, and he goes, do you know what that is? And Rob goes, do I know what that is? <laughs> I have a Pentecostal background. I didn't know you guys did that. And he says, what do you mean? He says, well, it's called speaking tongues. And he goes, yeah. And then his handler, he flipped out because he didn't know that Christians did it. So if the two would just only talk to each other. There'd be a, you know, a lot better communication going on or people would be a lot more informed. So these guys are all... They were babbling in tongues. And as we sort of see here, as we finish this chapter, it's one of the signs that the Ruach has fallen on you. You will speak in glossosolia or oliga oligarsia, I think. There's two forms of it. One of the, either that means you speak in a language you didn't know or you're speaking a secret language only known to angels and yourself. So, yeah, it's one of the signs of, of, of the legitimacy. And if you start speaking them, you you will probably get an interpreter if it's not a foreign language. Yeah, I was so going to say, it's secret. also one of the most misused. It's misused, yeah. A lot of people just yeah. babble, yeah. you know. It's easy to misuse it. But if, if you're doing it in public and it's not a foreign tongue, a German that you've never learned, and you're speaking German, then fine, you're in the clear. But if you're just doing glossosolia, which is the one that's the secret language, somebody needs to stand up and interpret it, otherwise you're out of order. Mm. But now, if you're in your own home and you're by yourself and you're doing it, then that's between you and Yahweh, but yeah. So Yahweh's good like that. He, he creates a barrier there so people can't muck around. But do, do they stuff it up? Yeah, they do. There's, there's different religious denominations all over the world. Nick counterfeits it too. Back in the Old Testament, Saul yeah. was found amongst the prophets yeah. and speaking in tongues. Yeah. Was so, he on God's side? Were those prophets on God's side? It's open to debate. Yeah. Well, he was. He was. Saul was originally appointed by Yahweh. It's interesting. I could talk. I could talk about Saul because. It's said that he does have a Saul does have a place in the world to come because he, even though he ended up badly, he was yeah. a bad guy. Yeah. There were some things that happened. It's like you know, father. Yeah, Achan has a place in the world to come, but he was stoned. But we can talk about that in another video. Um, uh, Messianic Jews. Okay, so and the Messianic Jews uh, who had come with Kepha, uh were standing in awe because they're going, "Whoa!" But also the coin had the gift of the royal carpenters been poured out, and they hadn't even been immersed. Or given a profession of faith. 46, for they were hearing them speaking, Lashon not, um, in other tongues, and exalting uh, Elohim. Then Kepha answered, Surely no one can refuse the mikvah, Mayim, the water immersion, or baptism, for these to be given Mashiach's um, Tavila, prayer of repentance, who received Keshu, uh, Tavila, prayer in the Ruach HaKodesh, just as we can be. So they're now going to have to do things in reverse here. Isn't that amazing? 
So we're going to mercy, we're going to get you to say the prayer of repentance. But the Ruach's fallen on them. And what have we learned about the Ruach? What have we learned so far about the Ruach? It's an enabling power. It's going to enable you to do something, to, to, to profess or witness to them. It's not just a fuzzy feeling you get, like having a, a hit from heroin. Verse 48, and Peter directed for them to be given the chef's uh, prayer of repentance in, sh- in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Then they asked him to remain several days. Why? Because they wanted to stay with that, where that presence was so strong and thick. They wanted to, they, and they wanted to see how this guy lived. How did this guy get up in the morning? How did he eat food? How did he interact? If you get a man of Yahweh come and visit you, it's good to try and get him to get, be with him, stay with him for a couple of days. Go out shopping with him, see how he conducts himself when he's shopping, and see him in every. Get him to be put in every conceivable situation you can, and you can learn and see. Okay, this is because he's an imitator of Yeshua. We're not to be imitators of anyone else, Rabbi Rob or anyone, but we're to imitate other people as we see them imitating Yeshua. Yeah? And that's it. Are there any questions? Are you look upset, did you? Are you not happy? Thank you. Any questions, comments, or statements before we have some yummy food? Andrew, you've been very quiet. I've been picking on you and you've just taken it. He'll deal with you later. Okay, so we're all clear that this is this is a monumental moment we're, we're seeing here. This is amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's so it's so out there. This guy, this centurion, um, is one of us. And you, you see that. You see a lot of foreigners, a lot of Roman um, dignitaries and people of, of Rome um, were, were finding this because if their lives were so upright, they did live upright lives. Mm. And it was it was starting to become appealing to people. And you see it today, what there was a guy that got up in America, a young student, he had a speech planned and he sort of stood up instead of reading the majority of the speech, he just did the Lord's Prayer and he got a standing ovation because they're calling the Lord's Prayer out of everywhere. I did the Lord's I did the Lord's Prayer when I was at school, mm. in a secular school. I don't do that anymore. It's, it's illegal to yeah. say say the word Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I went to school in America now. Sorry? It might have been Muhammad. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. 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 Yeah. It's so yeah, next yeah, president of the Christian to turn a law again the freedom of the law. It's all part of the last day of man. Uh, the last sort of 10 years or so, the Gideon's Bible's been disappearing from hotels and motels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But some some um, establishments are bringing Prophecies. it back because some people have complained. Um, yeah, good. We'll send the hunters righteousness into, of the nation. To get into the four corners of the land. Oh, there's a verse, um, yeah, I don't remember the address, it says, even when I was still in my sins, Yahweh gave me his only begotten son. So yeah, so though you'll have people like Cornelius who who aren't doing all the Torah, you know, like if the circumstances to some degree so won't allow them to do all the Torah. Said, so if you're a, if you're a, trouble, just say you're the king of, of some foreign country, if you want to become an Israelite, you it could get you killed. So so it might be applicable for you to stay again sharp. So these three different types of Noahide you don't have to do any of these. You can go straight to becoming an Israelite, but your current life circumstances might mean that you have to just do one or two of these for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean you're not an Israelite. It does. You're, as part, you're in the government. You're causing them a lot of yeah? trouble. So there's all different types of circumstances that might arise, but we all, the, the one Torah is for everybody. One Torah is for everybody. But see, Dallas is a woman. I'm a man. Come on. So she does Torah that I don't do because she's a woman. I do Torah that she might not do because she's not a man. She has a different job than me. She teaches kids. I, I'm a storeman in a missile uh, facility. So, so I might have Torah deal with that's different to hers. So we're keeping different parts of the Torah, but we all obey the one Torah. And so a ger, a ger, Tishar, Tishar, or Zaydi may be doing different Torah to a Baal Teshuvah, which is a returning Jew, like a Bamas, or a, a righteous Jew, or an intermediate Jew, but it doesn't mean they're keeping different Torah. There's different obligations, and it can sometimes be circumstantial. So don't let anybody say, oh, Jason was telling, teaching you about two Torahs, the one done by these guys and these guys, no, I'm not teaching that today. It's all the one Torah, but people are obligated to different things depending on 
depending on their the life student circumstances. who um, so, yeah. stood at the <coughs> lectern and he was about to do his speech. It was uh, illegal for him to, to speak about Jesus and Christianity in the school. Um, thanks everybody who's tuning in. Are we still broadcasting? All right, thank you if you've stu stuck with us this long. Um, sorry about the sound if it's not loud. We're having trouble pr trouble with our mic. Um, yeah, please tune in again. Sorry? That's all right, I won't come with you. Please tune in again and um, Shabbat Shalom to all those in America which are just coming into the Shabbat now. Bye, guys. And the, um, but that's to the 